All right, how is that volume wise? Looking here? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thumbs up. <laughs> All right, so today I'm going to be talking about disability in Game of Thrones. I will not be talking about season eight, and I will not be talking about season seven. There will be a spoiler from season six. So if you are many years behind and very precious about those spoilers, I give you permission to leave now. Will you give people a warning just before you spoil it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that will... I think just go now. There's going to be a, a... Yeah, it's going to be early in. Like, it's... Yeah. <laughs> There's just particular events. None of it is like the whole season up kind of thing, but there are particular things that I'll talk about um, that are going to be spoilers up until season six. Um, I will be focusing on disability specifically. There is some very interesting uh, things to talk about in terms of fatness in Game of Thrones uh, and also the book series it's based on, The Song of Ice and Fire, which I'm not going to really talk about today, um, mostly because it's not something that I've done a lot of work on previously, so I, I don't want to kind of go in the wrong direction there, but I think it is, it's definitely something that I think about a lot when I'm reading the books and watching the show, particularly thinking about the writer of the book, someone like George R. R. Martin, who is someone, I don't know if anyone's seen what he looks like, but he does live in a fat body, and it's very interesting to think about the way he presents fat characters, because it's something that's specifically mentioned, it's not just like a, you know, a bit of colour to the story, it, there are some beats that are very crucial to storylines, um, and the one that stands out to me is one that doesn't happen in the show, but there is a character... Actually, the characters exist in the show, but this story doesn't. Um, there's a character who is basically told that he, if he marries this guy's daughters, one of his daughters, he'll give him the daughter's weight in silver. So he's like, I chose the fattest daughter. And this character is known as Fat Walder because there are lots of Walders, so it kind of distinguishes her as that. Uh, but honestly, it's like one of the best relationships in this whole series. There's a lot of really sad relationships in this series. And it's one of the best ones. And I think, not to say it's a positive representation, but there's something interesting about reframing value in that way as not this kind of idea of superficial attractiveness, but literally valuing her by her weight. Not a good way to value someone, <laughs> but it's a different thing. And I think that's something interesting to talk about. But it's not what I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> so disability in Game of Thrones... It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, I wrote my honours thesis on disability in A Song of Ice and Fire, which is the book series. Um, I have written one chapter on disability of Game of Thrones, which came out in a um, companion to disability studies last year. And I've got another one coming out this year in another disability studies companion, uh, which specifically looks at Tyrion Lannister and a character from the books that never made it to the show and kind of compares them. Um, and as some of you know, I've also got a podcast on Game of Thrones and disability stuff comes up in that as we go. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, basically. Um, and I think it's also, for me, I mean, pop culture is the way that I think about academia most of the time. I find it a really useful way to think about it. Anyone who is in any of my tutorials would know that I like to go to pop culture frequently as a way of understanding concepts. And today it's going to be Game of Thrones. But specifically, I want to introduce a particular framework as a way of understanding this. Um, like with most frameworks, this is just a tool that you can use. It's one that I find useful. Um, so it's the concept of narrative prosthesis, which was introduced by two very prominent disability scholars, David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder. And before I go into what exactly that is... I just want to focus on this definition that Mitchell and Snyder put forward uh, for prestheticizing. So they say, to prestheticize is to institute a notion of the body within a regime of tolerable deviance. If disability falls too far from an acceptable norm, a prosthetic intervention seeks to accomplish an erasure of difference altogether. Yet failing that, as is always the case with prosthesis, the minimal goal is to return one to an acceptable degree of difference. So this talks to what we've been speaking about so far today. This idea that there is a norm, um, that norm has particular values of attractiveness, of health, of size, of ability, and that, I mean, let's be honest, probably none of us totally match that norm, but we're always trying to get as close to it as possible 
And this way of thinking about getting as close to that norm as possible can be thought about as prestheticizing. So it can be thought about in a very literal way of having a, a type of physical prosthesis. But we can also talk about prestheticizing the body in a broader way of like trying to erase difference as much as possible. We know we can never totally erase difference, but we can minimize it. Um, so for example, if we think about a prosthetic leg, an example of that would be making that prosthetic leg look like a flesh leg, as opposed to some cool like blade with flowers on it. So I mean, I've seen some amazing designs for prosthetics out there. There are some beautiful things going out and I highly recommend looking into them. Um, but on average, most people just go for something that you can kind of hide under your jeans and no one's probably going to notice. And it's just kind of creating that idea that, oh yeah, this is just a normal body. It's no different from your body. It's a normal body. So then if we talk about narrative prosthesis, narrative prosthesis is Mitchell and Snyder's way of situating a discussion about disability within a literary domain, and I'm going to broaden that today to talk about a popular media domain, um, while keeping watch on its social context. So we're talking about the understanding of disability in this kind of example of looking at popular media, and then bringing it back to the social context that we've been speaking about up until now, how is um, disability and body norms socially understood, and kind of putting them against each other and seeing what we come up with. So there are four ways that Mitchell and Snyder do this with narrative prosthesis. Well, there's four kind of things that they say narrative prosthesis does. The first thing is it refers to the pervasiveness of disability as a device of characterization in narrative art. Uh, and within that, I also want you to think about like how disability is used. So um, generally speaking, disabilities in terms of um, type of disability, frequency of disability occurring, doesn't line up to real life. Um, so statistically in Australia, um, one out of every five person has a disability. Um, and the types of disabilities people have are generally not kind of statistically represented in literature and popular media broadly, because uh, frequently disability is used as some kind of uh, tool in a narrative. It's there for a purpose. Uh, and not all disabilities necessarily have that kind of narrative purpose for the writer. So a lot of them kind of get put to the side. Um, interestingly, one thing to kind of think about is there's been some work into occurrences of disabilities throughout history. And you'll see at certain points in time in literature, particular types of disabilities start to get noticed more often. So um, following World War II, kind of in the decades following that, there was a lot more people with amputations because people had come back from war. And for the first time, many people were seeing on a pretty regular basis, people with amputations. So there were a lot of amputees in literature in that kind of time period. So the second point is, it enables a contrast between the prosthetic leanings of mainstream discourses that would disguise or obliterate the evidence of physical and cognitive differences, and literary efforts that expose prosthesis as an artificial and thus resignifiable relation. So if we kind of go back to what we were talking about a moment ago, we get this interesting contrast between the purpose of disability in a kind of popular context, like popular texts, movies, TV shows, books, and how disability is discussed in real life. So in, in real life, in a social context, we minimise, we erase, we pretend it doesn't exist, we medicalise. Um, but in a literary context or a TV context or whatever, we need to emphasise it and draw attention to it in a very particular way because it's there for a reason. There's a reason the writer chose to put that disability in there. Um, three, narrative prosthesis refers to the problematic nature of literary's transgressive ideal in relation to social violence that often issues from repetition of representational formula or anti-formula. So we're going to look at the way the social reality of disability exists in specifically Game of Thrones um, and whether that lines up with the social reality of people living with disabilities in real life, and generally, no, that's not what happens. There is a bit of a difference there. Um, and then on the fourth point, it's kind of looking at the inverse of that. So um, narrative prosthesis also acknowledges that literary representation bears on the production and realization of disability subjectivities. So we're kind of saying that disability representation both reflects in a problematic and not necessarily realistic way um, the social realities of living with disability, but then also it reinforces our understanding of disability in real life. We know from this subject and all gender and cultural studies subjects that 
representation matters. It shapes how we understand things. So our representations of masculinity and femininity shape in our heads what masculinity means and what femininity means. And similarly, the idea of what it means to be disabled is shaped by um, popular representations of that. So these are just a few different things that we'll kind of be thinking about when we're going through this text that is Game of Thrones. And um, just thinking about what disability is doing in that context. So what I'm going to do today is go through a series of quite common, um, let's say, tropes or narrative devices of disability that are, are seen in a lot of different forms of media. Again, this is not to say that all of these representations are inherently negative, but there's certainly things that we can be critical of and kind of unpack. So the first trope is this idea of the poor little thing, which is, I think, tying into that idea of like understanding someone um, through another character. So with both of these characters, a lot of... I'll go into one of them in particular in a moment, but both of these characters are characters who, in the show, I would argue their primary purpose is for us to learn more about the characters around them. So uh, Shireen on the left, she's very, very sweet. I really like Shireen. But mostly what she does is the way another character treats her tells us how we should think about that character. The character's nice to her, they're a good person. The character's not nice to her, they're a bad person. Hodor is the one I want to go into with into depth today, though. So Hodor, I mean, today I'm mostly focusing on physical disability, but I think Hodor provides a really interesting perspective because of the characters he's paired with. So Hodor is a character with implied intellectual disability. We find out more about that as the show goes on. He's also very physically large, and there's kind of jokes about him having giant blood in him and that kind of stuff. Um, he's primarily a character that we're supposed to either laugh at or pity. They're the two kind of primary things. We don't really know much about him because all he can say is the word Hodor, which is his name. Actually, it's not actually his name, but that's what people call him because it's all he can say. Um, so we, we look at this character, he's funny, and we go, oh, when we see him, and that's about it. That's kind of the extent of it. But he also has a very troubling function in the plot in that he carries around another character called Bran, who is a character who is paralysed from the waist down. So what Hodor does in this show, in addition to being funny and a bit, like, you know, provoking emotions of sympathy, is he's a wheelchair. He carries around a character that can't walk on their own. And when he dies, Bran gets a wheelchair. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a few really kind of uh, things to say about that. Again, if we think about Hodor as someone who does not have, as we would think about in this normative sense, full intellectual capability, and then Bran, who doesn't have full physical capability, we put them together and they create a fully functioning human together. That's troubling. Um, but there's a few other troubling things about Hodor. So first of all, Bran, as we will be introduced to in a moment, has this mystical ability where he can walk into animals, which means he can kind of put himself into an animal, he can kind of control them, see through their eyes. It's not supposed to be possible with humans, but he does it with Hodor, which one puts Hodor in the animal, the non-human animal category, for one. Uh, but there are also some deeply troubling issues around consent. Hodor doesn't like this. He can't fully consent to it happening to him. And there are certainly instances where it's kind of a life or death situation. And Bran is quite young, so I don't mean to say that Bran as a character is this inherently evil person for doing this. But there are definitely some troubling aspects to the way it plays out. And this is something, again, when we think about kind of coming back to this idea of narrative prosthesis, how, how we can understand problematic representations of disability in media and their kind of relation to the social world and the social reality of having a disability. This is absolutely what I would call a problematic representation, but it also arguably makes some interesting commentary on the fact that a lot of people with um, intellectual disabilities are incredibly vulnerable and have their consent violated quite frequently, statistically much more often. So it is something that we can kind of look at and be like, okay, there is a reality being represented here. I'm uncomfortable with it, but we can think about some interesting things by looking at that character. All right. So I'm curious, like, 
going to say, yeah. hey, um, I heard someone behind say, um, spoiler at some point when you were, oh, yeah. and so, I mean, I'm pretty sure me is going to spoil some other stuff during this. Yeah. So if you're feeling upset about spoilers, I really would suggest. Yeah, but like, def definitely leave it this point. Like, <laughs> If there's, they're yeah. they're yeah. not going to be spoilers from season seven and eight, but there will be spoilers for everything before that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess let's say the big spoiler. Are you leaving for that purpose? Okay. <laughs> are the big spoilers? Both of these characters die, <laughs> and both of these characters die in two of the most, uh, arguably the most emotional kind of beats in the show, and. There is certainly an argument to be made about the kind of cheapness of those deaths in that they're fairly two-dimensional characters. Um, and their deaths, when I was kind of reading some commentary about the deaths, particularly with Shireen, she was described as like the most innocent person to die on Game of Thrones, therefore was the most tragic. And in reality, it's like we don't really know much about her. And yes, absolutely, it's really sad that she dies. But a lot of it is like, oh, look at this poor girl who you know, has this thing with her skin and she's been hidden away because of it. And then she dies. And that's awful. And we're really sad about it. But we don't know her very well. Uh, we mostly know the people around her. And it's what's more interesting about that death is what it tells us about her parents and the other characters that are kind of making the decisions around that death because they decide to kill her. All right. <clears throat> Let's compare this to someone like Tyrion Lannister. Tyrion Lannister is, I would say in my experience, probably the most complex example of disability representation that I've seen. Um, he's someone who is, so he has dwarfism. And one thing I want to highlight from the start, <laughs> it's just a... <laughs> Um, what's interesting about something like Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire is it's drawing on this history of fantasy literature. And when we think about a fantasy series and the, the word dwarf, we think about characters like Gimli, we think about, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Those are the kinds of characters we're thinking about. But then we get someone like Tyrion, and we're told, like, no, this isn't a fantasy creature. He's a human being. He has dwarfism, but he's a human being. And, like, there are not a lot of fantasy examples I can think of that have human beings with dwarfism. Generally, you have dwarfs as an entirely new species. Um, so here's someone who has a human brother and sister that we know, a human father that we know, and he experiences a lot of stigma, a lot of social violence through having dwarfism in a world that is incredibly unaccepting of dwarfism. What I think is really important about a character like Tyrion as opposed to characters like Shireen and Hodor is that is one complex aspect of his much broader, much more complex character. So we don't pretend that dwarfism isn't an issue because in the world that he lives in, dwarfism absolutely is stigmatized and he experiences a lot of social violence due to that. Um, but he's also a very flawed character for so many different reasons that may be impacted by the ways that people treat him, but are not caused by his dwarfism. There's a lot of reasons for why he's a flawed character, but he's not flawed because he has dwarfism. Um, I'm just going to say something else, and it's gone from my head. Oh, um, another thing that's really interesting about Tyrion, and this is, uh, again, something that I don't see very often, is his, because he's so smart, He's able to really critically play with the people around him's expectations of him due to his disability. So what that means is, I mean, has anyone heard the term transgressive reappropriation before? Okay. If we think about the term queer, um, historically queer has often had quite negative uh, interpretations, but it has been reappropriated by queer communities in a transgressive way, and they've reclaimed that word and be like, yes, I am queer. Deal with the fact that you were calling us queer. We're going to use that word. We're going to do something interesting with it. And you're going to have to come to, grap like, come, come to grips with how you were kind of using that word previously. Tyrion does that with disability, and the way it's often um, in like real life, in disability scholarship, you might hear of the term like cripping as a way of doing this. Like we've got queering, we've got cripping. 
Um, this concept of like taking terms that have been intended to be derogatory, intended to be harmful, and applying them to themselves in a way that is quite radical. It's not just like, a, oh, I don't mind if you call me that. It's like, a, no, you're going to deal with the fact that what you said to me was really harmful and I'm going to throw it back at you and you're going to need to face that violence. And he does that a little bit to the characters around it, but more specifically and more significantly to the audience. The audience is having to deal with the fact that there are lots of different words that are applied to him, some of which as an audience we can pretty easily be like, oh, that's not okay. But probably some other terms that maybe we have heard in real life or have, like, wouldn't necessarily think about in quite as significant of a way. So by him acknowledging, like calling himself the imp, for example, he's saying, I am very aware of what everyone thinks of me. And I'm not going to pretend that it's okay. I'm not going to pretend that I don't notice or that this is just normal for everyone. I'm going to make sure they're aware of how I think, oh, I'm aware of how they think of me. So second thing, supercrypts, which is something we mentioned earlier. So supercrypts, as Jess was saying, can manifest in two different ways. One, it can be that kind of um, inspiration porn of, Oh, look, they're running a race even though they've got blades instead of kind of flesh legs. How inspirational. Um, but in a fantasy context, we get it kind of taken to the next level, which is um, their disability causes either directly or indirectly an actual supernatural power. So we've got the character of Mr. Amon, which is a pretty minor character at the beginning of the series, and also, shout out for actually casting a blind actor for that, because usually that's not the case. Um, he plays into this very long trope of the blind seer, the person who is blind, but they can see more than other people. Either like they can see into the future, or they're very perceptive. And it's the latter in Mace Amon's case. He's seen as someone who can um, yeah, see in kind of big scare quotes more than other people, even though he's blind. Um, but the two characters that I think are more interesting for this trope uh, Aya and Bran, so Bran, as we mentioned earlier, and Aya, his sister, both of whom experience disability as a very kind of transactional way of attaining supernatural power or, like, you know, just not quite human power. So, as part of Aya in the middle's training to become this kind of mystical assassin, she agrees to, or she kind of accepts blindness as this sacrifice for herself. So, Again, thinking back to one of the earlier slides of Jess, there's this idea within that that disability is inherently negative because it's a sacrifice, it's something we're tolerating, it's something we're putting ourselves through, but it's okay because we're going to get something better at the end. So Aya chooses that, and also in another kind of troubling aspect, she, it's not permanent for her, which kind of has links to another very popular trope, which I'm not going to be going into today, of the magical cure, uh, which is in a lot of, particularly like a lot of children's literature throughout kind of the mid 20th century. There's a lot of stories where um, once someone attains kind of moral purity, their disability is cured. Um, so it's kind of, it's not really doing that in Ali's case, but it's certainly there are some ties into that. Uh, but in Brand's case, it's not a voluntary thing. Um, in the very first episode, he's pushed from a window, becomes paralyzed from the waist down. But that particular act is in very um, clear ways tied into the kind of mystical powers he gets as he moves on. So there's a very big thing about him being a raven. Um, and I don't remember how much this quote is actually in the show itself or if it's just the books, but there's this idea of like, you'll never walk again, but you will fly. So we're being very explicitly linked, like this thing that's happened to him, this disability he now has, is being linked to the powers that he gets. So again, it's being set up as a trade-off. A bad thing will happen to him, but he'll get a good thing in return. So it all balances out in the end. A different way we can think about that kind of transactional nature is through the trope of disability as punishment. So rather than something bad, again, big scare quotes, bad happening to you and something good comes out of it, instead, you are a bad person, therefore something bad happens to you. And we get that, I mean, we get a little bit with Bran because there's this kind of idea of him, you know, he's climbing the walls even though his mum told him not to climb the walls and then something bad happens to him. Um, but more specifically, we get it with uh, Jamie and Theon. Jamie is someone who is 
definitely set up as our primary antagonist from the start, or one of the primary antagonists. And really the turning point for his arc where he starts to become like a good guy is when his hand is chopped off. Now what's interesting about um, Jamie is it's not just about disability for him, but Jamie has primarily defined himself as a soldier. Um, his understanding of masculinity and his own identity as a masculine person is very tied to his fighting ability. Um, so having specifically his sword hand chopped off is a really significant aspect for him because it's much more broad than the general capability of being able to use a hand, but when your entire life is structured around a particular function, that is fighting as a manly man, um, having that sword hand chopped off is incredibly disabling for him um, in that it kind of it forces him to entirely redefine his life. And interesting with Jamie, like there are much more practical ways that he could have replaced that hand, but what he ends up with is a golden hand. It's not very practical. Uh, I mean, he could hit people with it, I guess, but like there are much more practical, even in this kind of medievally inspired society, there are much more practical ways that he could have replaced that hand with something like a hook or something like that, where you can actually kind of grab things, but instead he's just got this big, heavy, not very useful hand. And again, it ties into this idea of prestige, normativity, like this idea that, you know, he is a normal two handed human, and he's also very rich, so we can afford one that's made of gold. Um, so that idea of the prosthesis is prestheticizing um, in a way that is getting close as possible to that normative, but then also with a bit of showy, like, I'm so rich, we'll put on top of that. Theon becomes a eunuch, and the eunuchs in Game of Thrones are a whole kind of new category of thing. I can't really think of examples in other popular culture that do it is in quite as interesting of a way as Game of Thrones does it. Um, but what's interesting about the eunuchs of Game of Thrones is they tie in understandings of capability with understandings of masculinity and queerness. So Theon does some pretty awful things. Um, he then ends up being captured and tortured um, and he's a few fingers and his penis is chopped off. And this, like Jamie, starts the arc of him becoming a better person. Um, and it is like, it's, I think it's a very affecting arc. I think when you watch it, like, you really feel for him. Um, but some interesting things kind of happen from that. So he, previously, his sister had been someone who he'd kind of challenged the, her claim to power you know, she's a woman in the family. She's probably not really appropriate to be taking on leadership in our family. But after this, um, he's able to be really supportive of her, really accepting of her, understand that she can be, you know, the leader of the family. Um, but there are some reductive ideas that are bound up in that. So this idea that he's not fully human and specifically not fully a man, the eunuchs in Game of Thrones are frequently referred to as not men, um, mean that he's kind of disqualified from this position of power that he would have had. Um, so he kind of has to buy into very cis-normative, heteronormative, um, reductive, ableist ideas in order for this logic to carry out. And it's more than that as well. It's more that, like, he is genuinely just a better person now. Um, but there are some kind of ideas playing out beneath that that I think are important to think about as well. Um, the unsullied army is another interesting idea. If we kind of come back to Foucault and this idea of normalisation, when we talk about body normativity, we're generally talking about ideas of um, health and capability and attractiveness and all different things bound in one. But in the case of the unsullied, they're not really thought of as humans in the same way. So they're, and they're soldiers. And their primary job is to be a soldier and to be able to perform in that very specific way. Therefore, we're kind of narrowing the definition of what the norm is for them to this very specific range of capability. By doing this, we can then kind of fragmentize the body of the unsullied into useful bits and not useful bits. So the penis is not useful. We can get rid of it. There's a scene where one of the slave masters cuts off his nipple and says, men don't need nipples. So a scene with the unsullied, they're literally being cut up until they're moulded into this useful creature. 
Finally, with Varus, he provides a kind of complicated example of this. Varus is someone who is also a eunuch, and originally we could say that um, his arc before the story begins starts off kind of in a similar way to characters like Theon and the Unsullied. Uh, but Varys leans into his ambiguous uh, gender, queer, able-bodied positions and uses that to his advantage. So we can say that Varys has been both disqualified from but also freed from a lot of restrictive understandings of gender, sexuality and able-bodiedness. So he's able to both occupy some of the spaces that only men are able to occupy, so positions of like kind of political power, but he can also occupy spaces that traditionally women and children occupy. So he has a whole child network that he has connections with. Um, he's frequently being um, connected with women in the show. Like in the very first season, there's a line about, you know, um, poison being the work of women and cravens, so cowardly people and eunuchs. So he's being kind of put in these different positions, and it means that he can manipulate those around him because they know they... He knows they don't quite know how to take him. He doesn't fit any of those categories. And rather than being self-deprecating about it, he uses that. And also he came as a fairly, like I think he was a fully grown man when he came to um, the city. So he also could have passed um, as an able-bodied person with a penis and no one's really going to know unless they see him naked. But he's chosen to let people know that about him and he's used it in a political way. So I'm going to end by quoting myself. <laughs> so shows such as Game of Thrones demonstrate an acknowledgement in the television industry of the value of disability narratives in pop culture and the overwhelmingly positive reception of Tyrion Lannister as a major character provides hope that more writers will follow this example. Yet Game of Thrones is also highly indicative of many of the weaknesses of disability story conventions. For a show that is widely regarded to be one of the best examples of disability representation in popular media, and um, Tyrion Lannister actually, like that character, won an award for George R. R. Martin in um, the disability, well, I'm not remembering the name, but it's a disability award. They actually gave him an award for that character. Um, the series still perpetuates some of the harmful stereotypes that often dominate stories about disability in pop culture. This, perhaps more than anything else, demonstrates that there is still much work to be done. 